computer. Here we go. So we are recording now. All right, so we are recording. And now I am back here and we are going to be from the current slide. Do you see the current slide on your screen? No. No. Share. Yeah. No. Gotta share. Right, that's it. <laughs> there we go, screen share. There we go. Ah, there's what I need to do. And we're gonna share that. So now. Now we're in business. How's that? Great. Good. All right. This is Pelagianism. And this was a, he lived, to, he was this, at the same time of Augustine. So we're talking about the end of the fourth century, the beginning of the fifth century. This is Pelagius. Pelagius is a theologian. And when it came to original sin, he said, when original sin occurred, humanity stubbed its toe. It didn't fall. It didn't trip. It just stubbed its toe and moved forward. And because of that, humanity could, could discern the difference between good and evil. Humanity had that, had, that, had not, that capacity had not been in any way, shape, or form changed. Okay, And so they could discern between good and evil. Therefore, humanity should be able to see God, should be able to, to see God and meet God and, you know, make effort and make an effort to reach up to God. Um, Augustine will defeat this position, but please don't ever under, please understand that none of these positions ever go away. They always have a way of resurfacing in a different vocabulary. Pelagianism resurfaced in the 19th century, um, is the way I will describe it. Um, if you were born in 1800, growing up in 1800, and you wanted to go visit a friend, you put a saddle on a horse, you got on the horse, and you rode to visit your friend. That's the way people visited people for thousands of years. Um, if you didn't, couldn't get on a horse, but you had a wagon, you hitched the horse to a wagon, and then you rode off on a wagon, call it a chariot wagon. That's what people did for thousands of years. If you wanted to start breakfast or cook or warm the house, you built a fire in the fireplace. That's what people had done for thousands of years. So life was pretty much the same. Okay, 1800, but look at 1870. <clears throat> If you wanted to visit a friend, you could actually buy a ticket and board a train that was steam powered and you glided over steel rails or iron rails across the countryside. During the day, at night, trains could move. If you wanted to cross the Atlantic Ocean, what used to take three months in a sail ship, which people had been using for thousands of years, thousands of years, it not only took 10 days because of steam, the harnessing of the steam and creation of steam ships. Um, so, so life is changing dramatically in the 19th century. And so people began to say, well, maybe the, the concept of sin was, was a little too strong because we seem to be improving. And with that improvement comes this understand, this progress comes improvement. In other words, we, we were making improvements in our daily life and we could see that life had changed dramatically. Well, if we're making this progress, then we are maybe improving. Okay. That worked until World War I, and a theologian by the name of Karl Barth was standing in a pulpit preaching. And as Karl Barth was preaching, he's hearing the cannons firing, you know, between the French and the German, destroying towns, destroying villages. And he realizes that this progress has created more progress for mass murder. We do it more efficiently at a greater scale. We can't talk about improvement. And he sat down and he published a book, the epistle of uh, his epistle, epistle the epistle to, to the Romans. And it put it all, it took this whole concept of progress and improvement. We're getting better and better and reversed it and said, Pelagius is once again wrong. Humanity has not changed. So Pelagius is saying humanity stubbed its toe and it could discern between good and evil and could, could see God. Semi-Pelagianism said that when humanity, when the original sin occurred, humanity fell on its knee. But humanity still possessed a little bit of grace and could discern between good and evil and could reach out and call upon God for help. This is where Erasmus was. This is where the, the, the church was at that time. This concept, most of the church at this time. You made an effort and God rewarded that initial, your initial effort with more grace. So salvation was in your hands. Do you see where it's at? 
Salvation mm -hmm. is in your hands. Pelagia says the same thing. Salvation is in your hands. And so you have the ability to do that. Augustine says when original sin came, we died. Our, our, whole, our whole structure, our whole being was warped. We cannot. So this is a dead person holding up a little flower. So that's how I talk of Augustinianism. You know, Augustine said, we died. We do not possess the capability of distinguishing between good and evil. It has destroyed our fiber. It has destroyed everything in us. And so this is, this is an important moment. This is where Luther comes down. He belongs to the Augustinian order. So he is going to take in this Augustinian position. And hence, when he says, I believe that I cannot of my own reason or understanding come to salvation, but rather it is God through the Holy Spirit who comes, calls, enlightens, gathers. You know, it is all God's gift. Salvation is God's gift. We cannot, we don't do it on our, on our own. So these are some of the things that um, these are, we don't need to see this part, but um, this is the, the basis of what we call an anthropology. There's what I'm trying to say, an anthropology, our understanding of an anthropology. So that's where, where I'm at when, um, um, when we talk about what is important here. Uh, for Luther, he's an Augustinian. And Augustinians will say, salvation is gift. Faith is gift. We cannot do it on our own. And that's where Luther finally come, lands on that. Okay. I read those terms before in books, and I didn't really know what they were. So I thank you for uh, clarifying. Good. We are recording. And now I'm going to share screen. By the end of these sessions, I will know exactly what I'm supposed to do. There we go. So now I will do this. I will do slideshow, current slide. Okay, so here's, here's, here's how this comes about. There are several trials that must occur in order for Luther to be declared a heretic and then declared an outlaw. The church will declare him a heretic, and then the state must declare him the outlaw. In other words, will they uphold the church's judgment or will they change it? There are the canonical trials. Priario said you are a heretic because you've questioned the authority of the Pope. There is a conversation with the Cardinal Cayetan in Augsburg, and Cayetan says that uh, Priarios was correct, that Luther is a heretic. Luther travels to Leipzig to speak with John Eck. There's an intense debate, and, and what happens is Eck declares him, says he is a heretic. Um, he declares that he's a Hussite, following in the footsteps of John Huss, who had been burned at the stake in 1415. So at the end of that, he is now officially excommunicated. Priorius declared him a heretic. Cayetan declared him a heretic. Eck declares him a heretic. So this is all happening in, in the year 1519, and then in 1520, he is excommunicated by the Pope. Do I have that there? Okay, we'll get there. So now it, has to, it comes to the state. The excommunication is published in 1520. We have a copy of it in the rare book room. It's a printed copy of the writ of excommunication. And so now the emperor, who is new to the throne, Charles V, will hear him. He decides he's going to hear Luther. So he invites Luther to what is called the Reichstag. Um, the way I translate Reichstag is to call the Diet, D-I-E-T. So you hear the Diet of Worms. And if you're not, you don't have Lutheran ears, you you're, it might be a little confused, the Diet of Worms. What is this all about? Now, Worms, it's Worms. Worms is a city. Worms is the Germanization of a Latin name, of a Latin term, Varmia, meaning low-lying, swampy, swampy area. In the low-lying, uh, swampy, moist earth. So, Varmia. Varmia. And so, it gets the name Worms. And so, the Diet is the meeting of all of the forces um, in, a consul, in council. It's like a parliament. Think of it as a parliament. There is the council of the electors. So I have the three archbishops who are electors and the four princes who are electors. There's the council of the princes. They have a variety of titles. Some of them are dukes. Some of them are grand dukes. Some of them are uh, prince archbishops. All this, they're the princes. 
And then there's the Council of the Cities. There is 50, at this point, there are 50 cities that are called imperial cities. You wanted to be an imperial city because that meant you could keep some of your tax dollars and use it for urban renewal. So to be an urban city was an important moment. So you have all of these people here. So this is a 19th century depiction of Luther now being invited to Worms. The emperor, <clears throat> pardon me, is sitting on the left. He is under the canopy there. That is Charles V. Uh, so he is listening to Luther. Luther is invited in to, to defend himself. He figures there's going to be a conversation. Um, so Luther walks in. And Luther is, there's, you see the table on the right-hand side, and you see books on the table and books on the floor. Librarians don't like when you put books on the floor, but oh well, what can I say? Um, we're a fussy group. Um, so Luther I thought he would have a conversation about what his beliefs were, and he was asked two questions. The emperor asked him, are the books on that table your books? And Luther looked at them. And in one of the, in the session, somebody said, let's call out the titles. So they had to call out all of the titles and write them down. So then after they finished that up, the emperor, Luther looked at them and said, yes, they are mine. Then the emperor said, had the second question, will you recant? So at the end of that moment, Luther turned and said, I need 24 hours to think about this. Um, <laughs> he still wasn't sure what, what he wanted to do here. He, you know, he was standing before the emperor, all of the secular powers, it's all here. And he thought he's going to have a debate. All he gets asked, uh, are these your writings on that table and probably on the floor? And will you recant? And Luther says, I need, I need time to think about this. So he's brought back the second day. And the same two questions are asked. Are these your writings? Luther says, yes. And then he is asked, will you recant? And this is the famous statement. This is the famous statement. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not reject anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. Some people add the final statement, here I stand, I, will not, I cannot be moved. We're not sure he said that part, but it makes a nice book title and make a nice movie title. But this we know is what he said. Unless you convince me, I, I cannot recant. Okay, I cannot and will not retract anything. Since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience, may God help me. Amen. So now he will be declared an outlaw, which means that he can be arrested. He can be executed. Um, he is now officially an outlaw. So... Now, what are some of the sources of authorities that Luther is using? We have church tradition, church fathers, we have reason, we have scripture. These are the, these are the arguments that he's looking at. These are the things, these are the, we, we all, all of us as theologians, all of us as Christians, we go back to church tradition. We look at the church fathers and mothers. We look at reason. We look at scripture. All of this comes into play when we talk about our faith, okay? So here we are, here we are, the sources of authority. And Spalatin is a librarian in, in Wittenberg, and Spalatin it becomes a very good friend, a friend of Luther's. And so um, Spalatin is a theologian, historian, librarian. He's also the electoral secretary. Please understand that Frederick the Wise, his elector, never spoke to Luther. Regardless of what move you've seen in movies, the elector never spoke to Luther. Luther was a monk. He's not going to be bothered with a monk. He, did never, he never talked to, to Luther. He heard Luther because Friedrich the Wise, Friedrich the Wise was in Worms. He's an elector. He hears him, but he never, he never really, he doesn't, he never speaks to him. The go-between is Spalatin. Spalatin is always the go-between between Luther and the elector in Wittenberg, in the elector of Saxony. Okay. So there we have this. So here we have this wonderful thing. So as Luther is headed back, Spalatin fills him in that as he is going back to Wittenberg, he will be kidnapped and he will be escorted and put into hiding because he is now heretic and outlaw and he can be picked up, he can be arrested, he can be tried and executed. The elector will not have this happen. And so he's taken to this place, the Wartburg. This is in the town of Eisenach where Luther went to, it sits on a high mountain 
a high mountain. If you ever go to Germany and, and they say, let's go to the Wartburg, take the bus, don't walk. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hurdle to get up there. And so you want to go up on bus. You want to go up on bus. And when you're up there, you'll see it's absolutely stunning. I have some pictures here, but this is above the town of Eisenach where Luther went to school. This is where Bach, Johann Sebastian Bach, was born in 1685. So everybody knew the Wartburg, the Wartburg. This is one of the uh, Elector of Saxony's, one of his castles. So this is where he's whisked off. This is what it looks like. This is our moment. You will often see this sometimes on uh, as a, it's an iconic picture. So here you are. And this is where Luther stayed. This is where Luther will be housed. He will be put into hiding here. These are the rooms where he will work. Um, he has a very rich diet. He's used to very plain food in the monastery. He's now eating some very rich food. He will suffer from constipation here um, because the diet is very, very rich. It's very rich in meats and sweet meats and all of these things that he was unfamiliar with. And so he suffers from that. So this is the room where he is, where he is going to spend a lot of time. That green thing that's sitting there is an oven. You stoke it from the back in the other room and these ceramic tiles, they then heat, they heat up. They heat up and they warm this room. So this is the warm room and this is where Luther will sit. And this is where he's going to do something very interesting. There is his desk, there's his desk, and this is where he's going to start working. He's going to work on a translation of the Bible, okay? So we are going to work, since you're on sabbatical, you might as well have a writing project. And when you're on sabbatical and you have a writing project, he's going to work on the scriptures. So this is how he gets to the Bartborg. He is put into hiding because he has to do something. He has to grow hair. He has to get rid of the tonsure, the marking of the monk. Um, and he has to grow a beard so that he's in, he's got a full disguise there so that if he happened to be seen, nobody would recognize him as the monk Martin Luther. OK, so that's what Luther is doing. He is there up in the Wartburg. He is up there. He takes on the name Junker Jörg, you know, Sir Jörg, Sir Jörg. That is his assumed name as his alias as he's in the Wartburg. So let's talk about the Bible for a moment. This is the title page for a very famous Bible that was printed in 1501-1502 in Basel by Froben. We, wrote, we heard about Froben last week when he printed the first Latin edition of Luther's works in 1518 and sent 600 copies all over Europe. This is the title page. This is what a, a title page of a Bible is in its in printed Bible. And basically what it's saying here is this is the, it's in Latin, okay? So we're, we're reading in Latin. And basically we're saying now the first part of the Bible, now for a long time renewed, comprising the Pentateuch, one with the Glossa Ordinaria, the literal and moral explanation of Nicholas of Lyra, as well as editions of Burgessensis and the replies of Turingim, new distinguishing marginal summary annotations. That's what this that's what this title says. So when you open this huge volume that weighs about 30 pounds, and it's only there's six of these volumes to do the whole Bible, um, this is this is what you would see. So the, the printer, Froben in Basel, is giving you some of the sales pitch, what to expect here, and why you should buy a copy of this Bible. So here's here's all the things that you're going to find in this Bible. So here we are, the first part of the Bible, and here it is, and all of this commentary of the Glossa Ordinaria, Nicholas of Lyra. We have the editions of Paul of Bergos or Bergensis, and then Matthias um, Turingi. We will have all of these, we will have all of these, uh, all of these commentaries there. So here we are, the Glossa Ordinaria. This is the uh, glosses the tongue. So this is the, the common tongue of the Bible. So here you have quotes from Origen, Augustine, Jerome, Bede, Gregory the Great, Nicholas of Lyra, a Franciscan theologian, okay, in France. And you see the dates when he was born and when he died. He knew Hebrew. He grew up in an area where there was a, a, Jewish, a Jewish village and he learned Hebrew. Then you have, you have here the editions of Paul of Bergos, and then you have the defense, defense of Matthias Düring. Okay, so this is the commentary. So, okay, this is who we're talking about. That's what Genesis 1-1 looks like. That's the page. That's the page of Genesis 1-1 of this particular edition of the Bible. We have four of the six volumes in the Cross Memorial Library in the Rare Book Room. What you're looking at is Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. That's it. All right, that's all you have. What you see surrounding it, the biblical text is in the middle that is framed by the white space. What you have around it is all of the commentary. 
the commentary of the Glossa Ordinaria, the traditions of the church fathers, you have then Nicholas of Lyra, you then have Paul of Bergos, and then you have Matthias During. All of this is commentary. It's here explaining just verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. There it is. In principio. In principio. There it is. This is what it looks like. This is a, an amazing moment. Here's the beginning of the book of Genesis, which we call in Hebrew, Bereshit. In principio creabit Deus caelum et terra. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. That's all that's here. All of the rest of this is commentary. This is what Luther would have read. This would have been read to him every time they had meals in the refectory. You didn't speak when you were a monk during meals. You heard scripture read to you. This is what was read to them. So here it is. There the, the green arrows point you to the sentences of scripture. You have commentary between those sentences and you have commentary surrounding it. So this Bible is heavily annotated. Okay. All right. This is the tradition. All right. So this is what they were starting a project where they thought they might be able to type all of this out and then create, create, uh, do word searches and have computers. Computers do a lot of work for us, but it never came to fruition. Not yet. But this was an attempt. So here's what here's what the commentary looked like. And you see on the on the left hand side, in principio creavit Deus caelum et terum. And then it explains what that sentence means. In principio. Here's what Alcuin said about the beginning. Caelum, heaven, bead. Here's bead. Here's bead talking to us, the venerable bead talking to us about Genesis 1. So you're surrounded by all of this commentary. All right. Here's Nicholas of Lyra. So now you get to Genesis. Here's Genesis 37. Here's a page. Here's a whole page of commentary of Nicholas of Lyra, who believed in natural exegesis, you know, natural exegesis, common sense, common sense exegesis. So he takes the text literally. Let's talk about this literally. So here you are, all of this wonderful commentary that you read and, and you're, you're covered with. This is printing, still uses all of these abbreviations that were common in the manuscript era, so you could condense all of that information in a neat way, all right? So here it is, you'd, you'd learn all these abbreviations. You got used to it in time. They had diagrams. These are the Nicholas of Lyra diagrams. They love, these are the vestments of the high priest. They love these diagrams. It is absolutely fantastic. Here are the Hebrew rabbis. Here are the Jewish rabbis um, discussing what the candelabra looked like in the tabernacle. This one says it's this. This one says it's that. So here are these wonderful diagrams that were there. And it's just, a, it's just exciting to leaf through this. 1501, 1502. It's absolutely stellar. Here's the, the tabernacle, the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, you know, the angels that are guarding it. All of this. So let's, there are four ways of reading. This gets a little complicated um, for us. So what I'm going to do is skip down a bit because I want you to see Erasmus of Rotterdam does something very important. All right. There we go. Erasmus of Rotterdam is a humanist. And Rasmus of Rotterdam works on this particular edition of the Bible that was released in 1516. This is, this is absolutely, this is absolutely priceless because I keep changing this. There you go. So they print this between October 2nd, 1515 and March 1st. They print the New Testament. The New Testament is printed by Froben in Basel. This is the title page. Ah, this is fantastic. Here you go. The new instrument. He doesn't call it the New Testament. He calls it the new instrument. And I love it. And he's telling you this is revised and improved. And then he says here, right here, at this, this, some people call this an hourglass. I call it a word chalice because it's not an hourglass. It's a word chalice. And right where two fingers would reach, Erasmus has, where Erasmus would hand us this word chalice, he says, therefore, whoever you are who loves true theology, read, discern, and then judge. This is revolutionary. This is the humanistic method. We have this cut, the 1516, 1516 in the rare book room. This is the game changer. This is the game changer. The University of Wittenberg will buy a copy of this. Luther will use this when he starts doing lecturing in the book of Romans. So therefore, whoever you are who loves true theology, read, discern, and judge. Erasmus is changing the court of appeal. You read, you make the judgment. So what is so interesting about this? I'm going to go right down here. We're going to, this gets very complicated very quickly. There it is. 
This is what you saw. This is the, the gospel according to John. Notice on the right-hand side, Latin. On the left-hand side, Greek. This is the first time in over a thousand years that Western the academics had seen the Greek text printed. This is an amazing moment. What Erasmus of Rotterdam is asking, is saying, ad fontes, back to the sources. The Latin Bible, the Vulgate Bible that we use, is a translation. Let's get back. Let's get back to the Greek. Let's study in its original language. There it is. And Erasmus says, I don't want any gloss. I just want the text. Don't give me the gloss. So we have this. We have this absolutely wonderful, we have this absolutely wonderful edition. And then what he says is, maybe we can, should now retranslate the Latin Bible and update the translation. Well, that's like saying, why don't we pray the Lord's Prayer in, in modern English as opposed to King James? You know, you're, you're, you're touching a sacred tradition. And so these texts for a thousand years were embedded there. And Erasmus is saying, maybe we need to retranslate this. Wow. So here we have this wonderful moment of this Bible that is presented, that is presented uh, by Erasmus of Rotterdam, and it, it changes the world. So what does Luther do? Here we go. I'm going to wrap it up rather quickly. He releases his German translation of the New Testament in September 1522. 3,000 copies are printed that September, and they sell immediately. So what Luther has done is he is in the Wartburg, he's on sabbatical, he has to hide, he translates the Bible into German. He is the 19th person to translate the Bible into German, okay? The previous 18, however, people who had worked on it had translated it from the Latin. Luther translates it from the Greek, okay? So there's the major difference. So here we are, here are, here you are. The 18 editions, and then the 19th is at the bottom of the page. There is the 19th edition, and there is Luther, number 19. He is translating it from the Greek, not from the Latin. And that changes, that's a game changer. So here you are. Uh, this was the Whore of Babylon. Oh, this caused a lot of problems. The elector was very upset with this illustration that Cranach put into the text because there's only one person who wears a triple tiara, and that is the Pope. And so they were making this polemical argument that the Whore of Babylon was the Pope. So they got very, the, the elector found it politically incorrect and said, change that. So in the December edition, what they did is they lopped off the two, they took a chisel and hammer and lopped off the two, two top tiaras, and it's just a crown now. So, you know, there you go. That's what it is. How much did it cost? A half a gulden for an unbound copy. You could buy Luther's German New Testament. Well, that doesn't help us. So what I do is I translate it as to, what does this mean? Well, for a half, for a, half a gulden, you could get two butchered sheep, 430 eggs. That was two weeks wages for a baker or four weeks wages for a maid. So who could afford this? Not very many. <laughs> but 3,000 copies sold in September. And when the second edition was released in December of 1522, another 3,000 copies sold. So people were eager to read this. All right. And so here's Luther translating. He does New Testament. Then he'll do the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, the history books, wisdom, literature, prophets, the Apocrypha. That's my dog, Lucy, barking. I can, she's just out there making some noise. This is his, his uh, the years he was translating. He starts in 1522 and he finishes up in 1533 because he was continually interrupted, trying to teach, trying to answer letters, to provide pastoral care. He gets married. There's the peasants' revolts. He's got all these issues he's dealing with. So it takes him a while. It takes him 11 years to do the translation of the entire Bible. But he did it. He did it. And so there it is. So there it is. This is Luther translating New Testament all the way through. And this is what the Augsburg edition looks like. We have this in the rare book room at the, at the Lutheran seminary, the Augsburg edition. And here's his table of contents for the New Testament. It's in German. And I'm going to stop here just so we can have a few moments to talk with one another. I'm going to pick up next week with this because you see there's a difference. You see some white space. And there are certain books that he would like you to read. And there are certain books where he says, eh, eh. 
the epistle according to the epistle of the Hebrews, James, Jude, the revelation of St. John. Eh, let's, he's, let's not spend too much time with that. And, it, you know, he's, people often quote James was he called it a straw gospel. But he said it's a good later. He had to explain that it's a good book. But I want you to learn about the life, the suffering, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And that you will find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all of the epistles of Paul, all of the epistles of Peter and John. And so that's where that's what he's, he's looking for. He's looking for in, in this in this presentation. So I'm going to stop the share here. All righty. So here we are. We are still recording. I'm going to stop the recording right now. And I will field any questions.